So welcome back, everybody. Uh, so we will continue with uh, Rajesh's second lecture. Uh, and uh, as usual, please unmute yourself and ask questions during the lecture. Hmm. And yeah, uh, so, sorry. Uh, yeah, so uh, next week we are going to convene again on Tuesday. Next week, hopefully, we will stick to the original <laughs> schedule of Tuesdays hopefully, and Thursdays. Yeah. Hopefully. <laughs> Until further notice. <laughs> until, until further notice, yes. Uh, uh, yeah, uh, that's uh, the thing. So uh, let's see if I can get my screen share and set up. Okay. Okay. Uh, um, so uh, so before I start, maybe uh, uh, the the topic of today's uh, talk, which is sort of going in the other way uh, from what uh, we described last time. So going from fields to strings. Uh, um, uh, are there any questions or any uh, um, comments about uh, stuff we did last time? So uh, I, I recall that I mentioned uh, uh, how uh, we have uh, uh, the, the general idea of, of deriving gauge string duality is something we want to uh, be able to do in a tractable limit. Uh, and uh, we focused on the weak coupling limit uh, uh, where uh, the underlying mechanism is, is this open closed string duality. Uh, so we started by talking about from the what that really means from the point of view of the uh, world sheet theory uh, and uh, uh, the original form of the Maldesena duality at large coupling was sort of the sum over holes uh, in this picture uh, here. Uh, um, and um, uh, uh, but when you sort of go to weak coupling in some ways the picture is simpler you just want to sort of associate uh, closed strings to open string diagrams and vice versa uh, and so today in fact we'll kind of uh, approach that same idea but from the field theory side which we'll think of as the limit of the open string theory uh, and so so if there are no for no questions, uh, let me uh, start uh, uh, describing that. So the question is, uh, oops, uh, how exactly uh, does a large n gauge theory uh, uh, generically, so we, uh, here in in many ways, what I will have to say today is very general uh, and doesn't rely on supersymmetry or brain constructions or anything. Uh, uh, so how how can it potentially become a a, a closed string theory? Sorry about uh, that or just um, colloquially, how do the holes or faces in the open string description, how do they close up? So that's sort of the uh, uh, question uh, uh, in the open closed string duality at weak coupling that we described last time. So, uh, so to do that, we'll start with, uh, uh, so you consider an endpoint correlator. Of single trace operators in the large end theory. So in the large end theory, the single trace operators as you probably know, uh, correspond to the single particle states of the dual string theory. Uh, uh, so we consider these and we are looking at the coupling. So looking at the large N free theory. Uh, uh, and um, uh, so the endpoint function, let's say just uh, 
So O's are these single trace operators and we'll work in Euclidean, we'll stick to Euclidean correlators to avoid various uh, uh, complications. Uh, so uh, we are in a free theory, which is conformal. So you can put it on a d-dimensional sphere. Uh, and, and we'll pick up the genus G contribution to the correlator. Uh, and uh, 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 so, so this is the object we'll consider. Uh, start will be our starting point, uh, and we know in the free theory what this is. Uh, so it's just given by uh, some of uh, some over all the Feynman diagrams, which are. Um, and that means basically all these double line uh, wick contractions. Yeah, and of a fixed genus G, uh, as I briefly described last time, there's a genus you can associate to, uh, 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 to all the uh, in the Feynman diagrams, as I said, uh, described over here. Uh, so that's uh, uh, just follows from the large end counting. Once one keeps uh, this coupling to coupling fixed, uh, and then you have uh, a dependence essentially on n and lambda like that. In particular, uh, the, the large n limit, you can pick out uh, diagrams genus by genus. So, <clears throat> Uh, so but just uh, yeah i have a nice question so if two theories are dual then can we always do the analytic continuation to go to euclidean i mean is there any satellite or is it uh, always true i mean quantum field theories are uh, well defined uh, uh, i mean uh, quantum field theories you can consider uh, in the euclidean quantum field theories and typically there uh, there is a a good analytic uh, continuation of the correlators uh, to a Lorentzian signature. It can be quite subtle. There are multiple sheets and so on. But um, local quantum field theories with some basic assumptions, I think, always have good extend uh, analytically. Uh, but 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 if I if I try to use flat space intuition for string theory, then what uh, Ashok and Roji showed us that we cannot go to Euclidean, right? I mean, there has to be, I mean, there has to be always a Lorentzian, I mean, sorry, the deep deep UV is always Euclidean and the D IR is always a Lorentzian or something. So is there any such satellite because we are doing, dealing string theory in the bulk or, uh, I mean, or we are just doing in the supergravity limit so we can, we can ignore those satellite things. No, we are not looking at the supergravity limit. In fact, uh, because we are at weak coupling, we are in the yes. opposite limit, a highly uh, uh, stringy limit. Um, uh, so uh, what I uh, uh, would say is that uh, in the, um, as far as the, um, uh, so uh, I think what uh, uh, I, the results that you mentioned uh, refer to flat space string theory. Uh, uh, I think uh, the Euclidean correlators in uh, in ADS CFT, the analog of S matrix elements are the Euclidean correlators. Uh, uh, so, uh, so I and at least in the case of ADS three, where one has worked um, uh, things out, um, um, uh, the uh, we we don't have. Um, uh, we we consider the boundary vertex operator I and mean the vertex operator uh, on a Euclidean world sheet with a Euclidean target space. Uh, those correlators seem to have good an analytic continuation to Lorentzian signature. So in some ways, that's sort of how the mm, uh, how the correlation functions in ADS. Uh, have been defined. Now there might be 
for the subtleties, but at least I think uh, if you consider Euclidean world sheets and Euclidean um, uh, uh, target ADS, uh, the uh, the correlation functions uh, that you that you are comparing to, there is a meaningful way to compare them. Uh, um, uh, yeah, and so uh, uh, and I suspect that. Uh, it, as the string theory amplitudes have a have a, this uh, continuation in at least in antidecitor space. Uh, so um, uh, so we have a sum over all Feynman diagrams of uh, genus G, uh, and um, so those are given by um, those are given by. Uh, uh, so let me just draw some Feynman diagrams in the free theory. So uh, often people get confused. Um, well, if it's a free theory, how do you have anything uh, non-trivial? But actually, uh, you can consider correlation functions of uh, gauge invariant operators, and there are uh, uh, non-trivial Feynman diagrams uh, that uh, uh, contribute to them. So. Uh, so I'm just drawing one random example. Uh, and this, uh, I'm drawing it in the tuft sort of way. Maybe this one is a little too thick. Uh, and so you can have uh, various with contractions uh, so i'm drawing a genus zero uh, feynman diagram which uh, means you can put it on a plane or a sphere uh, um, uh, so you can see here that it's uh, 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 if i have this would be some kind of a triangulation of the sphere with four points. Um, uh, if I think of these as fattened ribbon graphs in the Tuft sense. So this is a correlator uh, of uh, four gauge invariant operators. You can think of, uh, so the number of legs coming out from each vertex is the number of fields that are that the operator is built out of. So there are four here. So. Uh, so this would be something like trace uh, phi to the four and maybe trace phi to the five, another trace phi to the four, another trace phi to the five. Uh, and so phi, uh, for instance, could be a scalar. It could be some uh, combination of fermions, gauge fields, et cetera. Um, so they are the sort of letters that uh, the basic fields of the Young-Mills theory. Uh, so, um, so, the, uh, so you can have, uh, and obviously, if you consider more and more complicated gauge invariant operators with many, uh, many um, um, uh, individual Young Mills fields in them, uh, you can have many Feynman diagrams, and you have to uh, you have to generally consider a sum over all these diagrams, and uh, these uh, would become very large as uh, the uh, number of operators uh, increase. So, uh, so what I now claim and what we'll sort of justify in this uh, rest of this lecture is that we can associate uh, uh, to each of these diagrams uh, a particular world sheet on the moduli space so this is uh, n punctured riemann surface of genus G, of G handles. Uh, so, so I claim that 
to each of these diagrams, you can associate like a particular world sheet on the modelized space. So this modelized space is the space of all the inequivalent uh, Riemann surfaces uh, with uh, a specified number of punctures and a specified number of handles. Uh, so this one is, for instance, uh, um, as I said, there are four punctures. So uh, there are four vertex operators. So we're looking at an endpoint correlator here. Uh, so, uh, and genus G, so that's the same genus and N that appears on the closed string side. And so thus over here, this was genus zero and four points. So uh, the corresponding modelized spaces of the four punctures mm -hmm. here. Yeah, and um, uh, uh, so the claim is that uh, you can associate as a canonical way. Uh, so this is a canonical kind of a map uh, or a canonical way to glue uh, in, uh, in some sense these uh, 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 the Feynman diagrams. Uh, to, to form a closed string world sheet. So, uh, so I'll I'll try to flesh this picture out more uh, today, but I just wanted to show you uh, an, I, a picture of what I have in mind very roughly by gluing. Uh, that's so. These are like three strips. Uh, uh, for instance, this would be a three-point function on um, genus zero surface. Uh, uh, there's a canonical way to form a closed string. Uh, pants diagram uh, uh, out of this, and more generally, uh, I'll, uh, it's more difficult to draw. Uh, but uh, for an endpoint function on genus G, uh, I'll try to explain how you can picture it as different strips glued together in some very canonical way to form the corresponding closed string surface. So you should think of these as the so these are the open string. Uh, open string or the toft uh, and, and ribbon graphs. <clears throat> and the double line graphs and this side is the closed string. Okay, so and there's, uh, I claim, a canonical way to associate this, and uh, I'll try to flesh this out uh, um, more. But this is just to give you an advanced mental picture of what I have in mind. Uh, Rajesh, can, can I uh, confirm a naive expectation that uh, this picture seems to have? So in, in principle, I could have drawn the lines as thin as possible, so they, they need not have occupied any any surface area at all. Is, is that not right? Yeah. So that's the thing that we would be the we would have to assign a length to them, so to say, a width to them, uh, um, uh, and this. Uh, will come out uh, what that width is, I'll just mention. Uh, in some ways, uh, the, uh, I mean, at some, in some sense, the, the, the overall scale doesn't matter. Uh, but uh, what I want to say is that there's a relative width, uh, which is that multiple width, the length it, uh, will be proportional or the width will be proportional to um, the number of big contractions. So it, it'll be an integer. So you have three big contractions in some sense, it's three times as wide. And that notion will be important. The, uh, and later, I think when we realize it in terms of in the world sheet, these will be the number of bits that are there on the world sheet. Um, so it's like breaking up the world sheet into some uh, 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 bits, but um, yeah, so uh, and so they'll be uh, in some ways they are kind of discrete and point like, but in some ways uh, you can 
think of them assigning a certain width uh, uh, to and them. And the smallest unit is arbitrary. I mean, smallest unit is uh, for you to choose. It's what you, uh, this thing, it, it's just the like overall sort of arbitrary. scale. Yeah. Of okay. the, <clears throat> so, um, Uh, so the, the sum over uh, so so the basic idea is that the sum over distinct world lines in a large end field theory is identical to the sum or integral over distinct world sheets, which is what defines the dual uh, string theory. Uh, and so in some ways, uh, this is sort of the, the basic idea. Uh, so this is the central concept behind associating in the, uh, and so you can directly rewrite the sum over these diagrams over here, this, uh, uh, this, uh, uh, this sum uh, you can rewrite as an integral or a, or a sum or an integral uh, um, and which in which you associate each diagram to a, a particular world sheet. Uh, so that's uh, what I will now uh, describe so in some sense this is a ref this is a, a refinement of uh, the association uh, of a genus to Feynman diagrams of a Riemann surface uh, with genus G. So it's a refinement because now we are saying that uh, uh, Toft, of course, gave a broad classification of Feynman diagrams in terms of their genus. I'm saying you can do further. Each Feynman diagram you can really think of as a particular Riemann surface. Uh, and, and I'll describe that canonical map. Uh, so, um, uh, and so uh, this is uh, this thing, and uh, we are so uh, uh, and so uh, so that's uh, Toft's observation, and this uh, this allows us to uh, uh, to potentially uh, recast the endpoint correlator uh, as a world sheet correlator. Endpoint CFTB, the space-time correlator, as a world sheet CFT2 correlator uh, in, in the following way. So we had these operators. Now let me put some additional labels on them. but. Uh, so this was what we had earlier, but now we can write it as an integral over the moduli space of some correlator. Uh, uh, and these are some on-shell vertex operators. So that's your usual mm, string. Uh, so, so these labels, this is like the space-time conformal dimension. And these are some additional quantum numbers. 
uh, and um, so these Zs will refer to the world sheet coordinates. So I'll always use the convention that Xs refer to the boundary uh, coordinates, and um, the Zs will refer to the world sheet coordinates. Uh, so, so what I'm basically uh, when I write this equation, what I'm uh, saying here is that we can rewrite the sum over here, the sum over these world lines, we can rewrite as a sum over or an integral over uh, the moduli space uh, and uh, with some integrand, which uh, we can identify with the world sheet correlator. And uh, so, uh, so, so that's what uh, having such a relation uh, allows you to do. And uh, so, and this is, and I'll maybe mention at the end a bit, but uh, I won't go into the details, but this is sort of explicitly realized now. Uh, in uh, so, so if this sounds very general, but you, you can actually see how it works uh, in the case of the tensionless uh, ADS three CFT two, uh, mm, uh, where you can start with the dual symmetric orbifold correlators, uh, and at least in a particular limit, see how uh, exactly using this canonical mapping you can relate it to correlation functions on the dual theory, which uh, is something we can independently compute in that case. So this is something we showed uh, a few months ago in a paper with uh, Pranabesh as well as uh, Matthias and uh, his student, Bob Knighton. So, uh, so this is explicitly realized. Maybe I'll say a few more words about this after I've, after I've explained this canonical mapping. Uh, so, uh, so that's uh, that's what I will aim to do. So, so now what? Uh, so what I will do is uh, uh, so try to describe this uh, correspondence between world sheets. These Feynman world lines, as I like to call them that the Feynman world lines and the Nambu world sheets. So, uh, so this is, uh, uh, so uh, Rajesh, I have a question. Yeah, one, uh, yeah. yeah sure. uh, so this is uh, the, so what I'll describe is uh, based on old work of mine on this general correspondence. Uh, yeah, so and go ahead, Samansh. Yeah, so this equality that you wrote is expected to be true, not necessarily at the tensionless point, right? At least uh, in the- so, uh, Okay, so uh, uh, yeah, uh, so in a way, this uh, sum over the world lines, this I think is very general. Uh, what is true in, in at the tensionless point is that we will have uh, these uh, uh, mm, uh, in the free angles theory. There are no vertices other than the external vertices, and uh, you just will be. Uh, you can rewrite them in terms of uh, the dual tensionless string uh, theory. Uh, when you turn on interactions, at least in perturbation expansion, where you have a Feynman diagram expansion. Uh, you can, of course, to any order in lambda, you will be adding additional vertices, uh, uh, but you are essentially doing with contractions. So you can treat them with the same, uh, you can treat them in the same way, uh, but now you think of a four point function with interactions as essentially, uh, if I have one insertion of lambda, that's like essentially like a five point function or right, two insertions right. of lambda, like a six point function. So you think in perturbation theory around the tensionless limit. So you think of these on the dual side also as perturbations of your world sheet theory around the tensionless uh, limit. So in that sense, I think it generalizes. So as a perturbation expansion, uh, 
uh, with um, in uh, uh, with the insertions of operators. Uh, uh, it, it, given the four point function or endpoint function of uh, for strong tooth coupling, I can also write that equality, right? And that there will also always be this integral. Of, I mean, the the endpoint correlation function of four. Uh, yeah, of, uh, this of course will be always true. Uh, uh, this will be always true, but uh, um, uh, uh, this, of course, is a general statement. But um, and so here, this the point of uh, making this statement, I mean, the equality of these two sites is, of course, the equality of the ADS safety corresponding. Right, right, the right. point of making this statement is, is utilizing this equality over here, uh, which uh, 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 which essentially tells you that you can recast this in this way. Uh, you can try to manifestly rewrite this as a sum over world sheet correlators. Uh, so because, uh, because the sum over the world lines, you can, for each Feynman diagram, I can associate a, uh, um, a point in the moduli space and there'll be a weight or an integrand associated with that. And then I sum or integrate over the moduli space. That's so I can define that as giving me the world sheet correlator uh, in that particular case. And that would be a world sheet correlator in the tensionless string theory. And uh, if I want to extend it beyond the tensionless theory, I would have to think of uh, corresponding four point function and so on as a correlation function in the mm, uh, in the tensionless theory with uh, additional perturbations mm, uh, integrated perturbations uh, of uh, the corresponding marginal operator in the world sheet theory uh, so i should imagine what i do in field theory only namely i put some perturbation here and right, uh, right. Some perturbation here and i'm sort right. of exponentiated it but in it's in that sense that i should understand this recasting uh, away from the uh, zero coupling limit so in some sense we are always doing perturbation theory around the tensionless limit uh, it, uh, what it resums into at large coupling it's uh, I'm not making any statements about so uh, uh, you you can uh, it's like in any conformal perturbation theory you uh, if you know it's an exactly marginal operator then you can try to make some statements but yeah okay yeah thank you <laughs> so the fact that you're assuming that there is a one-to-one -one map between the quantum numbers on the o between the o's and the v's yeah. Is that an assumption or? It, yeah, yeah. So I should uh, have said that. Yeah. So this assumes that uh, there is a. So what uh, Ananda is saying is that. Uh, 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 so so there is a. I'm assuming that there is a dictionary. Uh, so. Uh, uh, and this is the equality of the spectrum. So before I look at correlators, I need to um, need to really uh, argue first that the spectrum on both sides match. Uh, uh, so for each uh, vertex operator uh, uh, in the uh, which corresponds to a single particle state in the uh, dual string theory, there is a single trace operator in the uh, dual CFT. So that uh, correspondence I need to have uh, uh, to be able to even make this statement. Uh, and, and so this is why in the examples that we studied, the first thing we did uh, is to match the spectrum on both sides. And then we can hope to compare meaningfully the correlators. And we did that in the case of ADS3 CFT2. We first looked at the full spectrum of uh, all single trace operators or all uh, single particle uh, states in the string theory and uh, uh, argued for their equality and afterwards uh, used that to argue for the equality of correlators. Um, in the case of ADS5 times S5, uh, we, uh, uh, what we have recently proposed is uh, the, this correspondence of the uh, spectrum uh, with the dual string theory. 
uh, and uh, and uh, work that's in progress is trying to flesh out um, the statement about the correlators in that case. And Rajesh, is, is there something that uh, avoids asking a more creative question that maybe uh, one, uh, uh, the, the right-hand side has more quantum numbers and you need to average in some creative way over those quantum numbers to get the left-hand side? You mean uh, the, the right-hand side, the string theory has uh, more quantum numbers? Yeah, yeah. so you're, uh, you're sort of uh, integrating over Z in, in a yeah. similar spirit. Can, can you also average over some extra quantum numbers? Yeah. To, uh, yeah. So that's the, the point I will try to make that in some sense that extra Z, well, in the simplest case, I think this integral just becomes a sum. Uh, so I think the dual to free Yang Mills theory, the correlators have delta function support. So that's why I've been saying sum slash integral. Uh, uh, so the integral really becomes a sum and that sum is really this sum. Right. Uh, so uh, uh, in, uh, in some sense, uh, uh, you can associate the uh, so uh, this uh, these z's are essentially coordinates of the modelized space uh, and um, uh, you're summing over either some discrete number of points or in some limit uh, integrating over them uh, and there will be an analog here which is summing over the corresponding uh, there will be these lengths that i mentioned uh, which uh, will be playing the same role as so that's what effectively the sum over diagrams does. It's a combinatorial sum, which is summing over all the different possible big contractions. Uh, and that sum is, uh, so here that sum is suppressed because I, but if I write it as a sum of Feynman diagrams, then there's a sum on this side as well. Uh, and that sum is uh, each summoned in that sum is the same as each term here. So that's the refinement in a way that I'm, uh, uh, proposing that it's not just that somehow miraculously after you integrate over the thing you produce this and look at it at the level of the integral integrands or the summons and uh, make an equality between both sides uh, and the modelized space is reflected in the Feynman diagram so this is what I will now try to uh, um, explain this correspondence a little bit uh, in a uh, little uh, detail, but any other questions before that about, so in a, in a way what I have, uh, uh, what I just said is the summary of what, uh, the, uh, that's the sort of the conclusion, but now I'll try to uh, give the reason a little bit. Uh, so, okay, so, uh, So the, uh, so the correspondence works in two steps. Uh, so as I said, this is a proposal uh, which, uh, but by now uh, we, can, we, have, uh, we have multiple pieces of evidence, including the explicit realization that I mentioned uh, above for the ADS3 CFT2 case. Uh, and so I will uh, not be uh, deriving uh, this proposal from anywhere. It is sort of, uh, it is a proposal which, uh, uh, which uh, is about making that intuition of open closed string duality concrete. So the first step, so I'm starting from Feynman diagrams, like the ones that I, uh, I had here mm, mm, these Feynman diagrams, uh, and I want to associate a closed string uh, um, world sheet uh, to it. So I claim mm, that uh, sh uh, the first thing you need to do is uh, uh, to go from that original graph to a simpler graph, which I'll call the skeleton graph. So what you do is uh, first, Uh, and glue all the homotopically equivalent uh, 
And so this is on the genus G surface corresponding to the Feynman graph. Uh, Mm -hmm. uh, so, so what do I mean by this uh, glue all of them? This is in a way what one does. Uh, 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 so what um, in position space, supposing I have multiple big contractions, And then I mean there could be others to other vertices, but between any two vertices i and j, uh, if I have uh, some weak contractions, you can actually glue up all the ones which are uh, homotopic. In this case, uh, these three uh, lines, you can uh, glue them up into. one fatter line to which you associate the number nij which is the number of big contractions between these vertices i and j uh, so what is one doing uh, basically in position space uh, what one does is you have each individual propagator in a free theory some one over xij squared to some power delta uh, and when you have uh, uh, um, Nij homotopic ones, uh, what uh, you get is a total weight, which is one over Xij squared to the power two Nij delta. Uh, uh, so you, you are just essentially in position space, you don't have to do these uh, loop integrals, you just have to, uh, you can directly write it. Uh, 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 in this in this way so uh, so we uh, so uh, what we do is we convert the graph into the skeleton graph by gluing this but we keep the information about the number of uh, the wick contraction so we keep track of the data nij by uh, associating this number so with each edge uh, we can associate this number nij like i have uh, written over here and so so what we are doing is we are capturing this uh, captures the Uh, topological connectivity of the original graph. So, uh, so the nice thing is that now uh, you don't need to keep track of all the large number of uh, uh, with contractions that might be there uh, if you just want the topological connectivity. So you just have to sort of, uh, so our original diagram, which had all these big contractions, you just replace by things which are homotopic, you just replace by one. Uh, a single fat line to get the skeleton graph. So the skeleton graph is essentially like this, but we keep track of the big contraction. So we uh, remember uh, in the original diagram, this is referring to the uh, uh, diagram that I had drawn earlier. Uh, 
so, so in this diagram, there were two weak contractions here, one here, two here, one, so on. So, so that's what, uh, so I draw the skeleton graph and I keep track of the number of big contractions that are there, that were originally there through these numbers that I associate with each edge. And you see that I can now do this even if there were uh, 5 million big contractions between this edge and that. Uh, I, uh, it would have been, of course, made for a very messy Feynman diagram, but uh, I can glue it all together into a single edge uh, uh, between these two. and. Uh, uh, I just put in the number 5 million there, and here there might be uh, uh, 4 million, here there might be 1 million, and I, I glue them all together. I glue all these different big contractions, and in a sense, all I need is the numbers and uh, the topology of the connectivity of the graph, which in this case is captured, you can see, by a tetrahedron. So, uh, uh, so this is, if I draw it on a sphere, you can probably visualize it that this is, uh, this is really like a tetrahedron. You can think of uh, uh, this as the base of the tetrahedron and this is, this point is sticking above it and uh, it forms a tetrahedron. So, mm, uh, uh, so we get uh, 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 the topological connectivity uh, by the skeleton graph uh, together with the... Mm -hmm. And together with the data, these NIJs uh, associated to each edge, each edge of the skeleton graph. Okay, so this is purely a mathematical uh, way to capture the original graph uh, information here. But now this is actually helps us a lot because now let's uh, do some counting uh, about what this uh, skeleton graph is like. So you see that the uh, a lot of the complexity has been uh, of the Feynman diagrams has been absorbed into just these numbers because in the end the Feynman amplitudes also just depend on these numbers because of this property that I mentioned in uh, position space that uh, which one has so uh, so so we have uh, we've kind of absorbed that uh, complexity uh, there but uh, let's look at the topology of this skeleton graph. Uh, so the uh, so the topology is as follows. Um, the graph has a generically triangular face uh, has generically. Uh, triangular faces because uh, generically if I, a big contraction is allowed by uh, the planarity uh, by the uh, you know the fact that you can draw it on a uh, so uh, what was Toft's idea Toft's idea was that you can think of the Feynman diagrams as giving some kind of a triangulation of the Riemann surface or more generally some uh, way in which you decompose the Riemann surfaces into these faces. Um, and each face is just formed by uh, the edges of the Toft diagram. Uh, now, if there was a, a square face, generically, I can always have, uh, uh, at least the topology allows me to have um, uh, that square to be divided into two triangles. Uh, with a diagonal contraction as well. Uh, and uh, that will not affect the genus of the Riemann surface that I draw it on. And generically in a generic Feynman diagram, I will have uh, those uh, triangular faces. Or, or if you wish, I, uh, if I don't have them, I can, this number, I associate a number zero to um, that, uh, that face. But generically, I can think of uh, the skeleton graph as a triangulation, uh, so this gives us a triangulation of the uh, 
Riem uh, of the uh, Riemann surface on which the Feynman diagram is drawn. Uh, so now there's, uh, so what do we know? We, if I call V the number of vertices of this uh, skeleton graph, we know that that's just N, the number endpoint function. Uh, but we also, if we have the fact that the skeleton graph has uh, triangular faces, um, then you also know the following. Uh, you have this relation between the number of, so V is the number of vertices of the skeleton graph. This is the number of edges. And this is the number of faces. Uh, so you also have this relation that twice E is equal to 3F, because if each face is triangular, uh, then um, you multiply by three, you get the total number of uh, edges uh, that are there. Uh, but each edge is typically shared by two faces. And so you have double counted uh, the number of edges. So that's so really twice the number of edges is equal to three times the number of uh, uh, faces, right? Uh, so this is because uh, triangular faces are shared, each edge shared by, uh, so since each edge is shared by uh, two triangular faces. So now um, we also know that this has genus G and you have this famous formula of Euler's um, that vertices minus edges plus faces is equal to two minus two G, the genus. Uh, so you use this. Uh, so this means that V is N and then uh, you eliminate uh, E in terms of F, you get N minus F by two is two minus two G. I've just put E is three F by two in this. Uh, so you get N minus F by two is this. So which implies that F is equal to 4G plus 2N minus four. And, uh, and then using, going back to this, uh, 2E is equal to 3F, this implies that E is equal to So this is uh, a very useful observation that you see that the number of edges of the skeleton graph is something like 6G minus six plus three N. Uh, uh, and uh, as I said, we have, um, we will assign a, In fact, uh, this assignment uh, was something proposed by uh, Razama, uh, modifying a prescription that I had um, uh, um, given. Uh, uh, but uh, I think at least in a certain limit, I think this is the, uh, the right assignment that uh, uh, one needs to, uh, to make, you assign a length to each of these edges. Uh, recall that nij, ing label vertices, so of the skeleton graph, so the pair ij labels an edge, uh, and so you can associate uh, this number uh, uh, to each of the edges. Okay, so I just, I think, had another example of this uh, gluing. Uh, so you can see that in general, even I drew a six-point six function there, but uh, here, but um, with multiple 
weak contractions and you can glue it into uh, a skeleton graph like this. But you notice that depending on the different, even at genus zero, if there are different big contractions, you can have different skeleton graphs. Uh, uh, um, beyond four point function, uh, there are different ways of triangulating things. And you can see that I could have, uh, uh, for instance, instead of having one of uh, these two edges, I could have had this edge and this edge that would have given another um, triangulation. And so there are, as one increases n, um, the number of points, one can have uh, multiple sorts of triangulations. So you have both different topologies of the skeleton graphs, and you also will have different numbers associated to each of these edges. Okay, so this is the first step uh, in the procedure. And uh, the thing I want you to notice from here is that now this just depends on G and N. We started with uh, something, a Feynman graph, which had all kinds of big contractions and everything, which uh, depend on uh, the number of big contractions. But the skeleton graph uh, knows, uh, so in the end, you can uh, distill all that information into that for the skeleton graph, whose topology just uh, knows only about uh, which only knows about the topology, the number of vertices and uh, the number of handles, and uh, all the information is uh, packaged in uh, these numbers nij. Okay, any questions? Uh, okay, so then I'll. Uh, and go to the second step. Uh, so this, the first step was what I called uh, gluing, gluing these Feynman diagrams into a skeleton graph. And the second step is um, a little more intricate one, which uh, uh, connects this to the modelized space of Riemann surfaces. And for that, I need to tell you a little bit about some very nice pretty mathematics um, and so so the first thing to notice is that uh, the number of edges uh, of the skeleton graph is equal to uh, what i wrote above 6g minus 6 plus 3n which I can write as 6g minus 6 plus 2n plus n. And uh, you'll recognize uh, those of you who know a little bit about the modelized space of Riemann surfaces will recognize that the 6g minus 6 plus 2n is the real dimension of the modelized space of genus G n punctured Riemann surfaces. Uh, and uh, this will be uh, so. An, uh, so this is uh, um, uh, already uh, somewhat suggestive, uh, and uh, in fact, uh, the claim is that uh, uh, that uh, the these skeleton graphs. Uh, describe different, so to say, cells in a, in a kind of a simplicial or triangular kind of decomposition of modelized space. Of not your ordinary, uh, not, uh, so there is this additional N. So it's actually what is sometimes called the decorated modelized space. You associate an additional real number, a positive number with, uh, uh, with each puncture or each uh, this thing. So, uh, so in fact, that's why uh, the number of uh, the number of uh, uh, 
edges uh, and uh, which is equal to also the number of the nijs uh, is equal to this so you, you can already see that if when i sum over all the nijs that's essentially summing over something which is in this space uh, who it's characterized it has dimension uh, uh, that's the same as that of the modelized space uh, so to tell you why this is true i have to explain uh, um, so uh, so to explain so we'll try to explain this uh, and for that I, i'll have to tell you a little bit about a very nice bit of mathematics of riemann surfaces Uh, which goes uh, under the name of the treble quadratic differentials. Uh, so, and so that, in fact, I think is at the heart of this gluing procedure to go from uh, the uh, field theory diagrams to the string diagrams. So, uh, okay, so this, uh, there'll be a small interlude, which is kind of purely mathematical. I'll just tell you some of the mathematical facts and you can, uh, if you want, I can give you more references uh, for details. So what are these treble differentials? Uh, so these are very special meromorphic, Uh, uh, quadratic uh, differentials on uh, Riemann surface, let's say. Uh, so sigma G and N refers to Riemann surface of genus G and punctures. So these are meromorphic and uh, quadratic, so that means you can locally write them as uh, uh, in some local coordinates uh, of a local choice of holomorphic coordinates. Uh, you can uh, write it as uh, uh, dz squared. That's uh, uh, that's saying that it's quadratic and it's. Uh, holomorphic or meromorphic, uh, so it depends only on z, not on z bar, uh, and this also specifies how it transforms under a holomorphic change of coordinates, because you go to some other coordinate w, you'll just make, you get a factor of dz by dw, the whole square, in addition to the uh, replacing z as a function of w, so, uh, so, the, uh, so that's how they are locally uh, and moreover, they have only, uh, they're meromorphic, so they can have poles. Uh, so they have, but they have only double poles. And, and these are at the N marked points. Uh, in the ZI, so I will use ZI uh, I equals to one to N as the N punctures or the marked points. Uh, remember that's what I used earlier also as the location of the uh, vertex operators. So you should, uh, uh, this is the notation I will uh, mostly be using. So they have only double poles. Uh, so what that means is that this phi S, so S is for treble. So that's just to distinguish it from a uh, generic quadratic differential. So what this means is that it has double poles, means that near z equal to zi, it locally looks like this. There's a double pole at uh, z equal to zi. Uh, and uh, moreover, mm, and this uh, characterizes, uh, this is one of the characteristics of the treble differential, is that this uh, coefficient here, 
So there's a minus sign, but then whatever remains is a, a real number, a pi square. And so if it's a real number, I can write it as, as the square of another real number, uh, a positive number. Uh, sorry, pi square is a positive number. So uh, I can, a pi itself is a real number, which I can also take it to be positive. And this is the analog of the residue for a quadratic differential. Uh, I mean, if I were to take a square root, I would have had an ordinary differential and a single pole, simple pole, and this would have been the usual residue. So this is the analog of that. And so this residue is, uh, uh, is invariant under the change of coordinates, as you can verify. So, uh, so that's how it behaves. Uh, mm, so, but that still doesn't fully characterize what a struggle differential is. What really characterizes them is that uh, uh, these uh, uh, struggle differentials uh, have a finite number of first. Uh, zeros and they're generically simple uh, and I'll denote the zeros by a the poles will be z zi and the zeros will be ak uh, such that if I consider a contour integral Well, not a contour, I mean a line integral uh, between any two zeros, then with an appropriate choice of orientation, this uh, integral will also be a positive real number. Uh, so uh, so in general, of course, it need, uh, need not have been, uh, it would have been a generic complex numbers. So this, uh, the, the, uh, these numbers, the, the fact that they are positive real numbers uh, is a constraint on the form of this uh, quadratic differential. And these are sometimes called the Strebel lengths. And uh, this is, now completely characterizes them. And this is what makes them very special. Uh, and there is a, basically uh, uh, a, a statement that they are unique. Uh, so uh, for a given, Uh, um, Riemann surface. So for any Riemann surface in the modelized space of genus G and punctured Riemann surfaces, suppose I'm, a, I'm given a Riemann surface. Uh, so there's a point on MGN uh, and a set of numbers, PI, which belong to the R plus to the N, some set of positive numbers. Mm, and there is a unique Strebel differential um, uh, uh, with uh, residues pi at the at its double poles and in the corresponding lengths, these treble lengths uh, are, uh, are therefore uniquely determined. So there's a unique, this thing and And these uh, lengths are uniquely determined. And it goes the other way around also. Given a set of the L uh, these uh, Strebel lengths, 
uh, and um, uh, you can uh, you, you get a unique point on the modelized space. So to explain that, uh, there's a very nice geometrical picture of what is... Uh, so geometrically, you can understand this. So... Um, Rajesh, yeah. you don't have to make any assumptions about how phi, phi z goes, uh, behaves at infinity. So there, there's a compact Riemann surface except for these double poles. So you just have to specify. Oh, z, 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 oh I see. So Z has finite. Uh... Uh, z is, yeah, because it's a genus G Riemann surface. And uh, uh, so if you wish, you can think of uh, Zi's as going to infinity. Uh, and because they are like punctures. So you're going to infinity there if you want to think of it in the language of sort of extended cylinders and so on, then this is the behavior at infinity. Uh, it's can formally map to mapping infinity to, uh, you can map it to a finite uh, point or you can think of it as infinity. And this line integral that you're mentioning, that, that is independent of the path. I mean, this is just uh, an yeah, that, complex that, line. Exactly, it's a complex line, uh, this thing. So, uh, and of course, uh, you uh, there is a, uh, I mean, the, uh, you, if you go around the pole, of course, you'll pick up a residue, but those are also proportional to PI. So they won't change this. this uh, so, uh, so yeah, you have to be a little more careful. If you want to define the Strebel lengths, you have to define it in a homotopy class. Uh, uh, so within a homotopy class, uh, these are uh, unique. <laughs> I mean, they are uh, independent of the contour. Yeah. So apart so, from the zeros and uh, apart from the zeros and the poles, nothing uh, nothing else is needed for the uh, for phi z. I and mean, you don't require to know phi z anywhere else. Right. So so the data that specifies. Phi, uh, so if I tell you these lengths, and uh, then essentially that's one way to completely specify it. Uh, phi z. No. no, I'm asking whether you explicit uh, need the explicit form of phi z everywhere, or it's only the zeros and the poles that you need. Uh, mm -hmm. I mean, when you uh, when you say need uh, for what? I, I mean, mean, when you do calculations, I mean, uh, when you do calculations, would you be using uh, the explicit formula for phi z or? Uh, yeah, well, I mean, it depends for uh, on what. So for what I'm going to say, we won't really need it. Uh, we'll only need the. Mm, uh, yeah, we won't really need it. Uh, uh, but uh, if one wants to sort of uh, so this uh, so what this treble differential gives you ultimately is some kind of parameterization of modelized space in terms of these lengths. So if you uh -huh. wish, it's a different coordinateization of the modelized space. Uh, so these lengths, uh, uh, these LKMs, uh, it gives you a real parameterization of modelized space. Now, if you want to uh, explicitly compare that with your some other favorite coordinateization of modelized space that you might have in terms of, say, uh, the positions of the punctures and, I mean, just the ZIs and uh, uh, maybe some other model I like tau and whatever else you have in higher genus, um, then the relation is quite transcendental between them. And for that, you would need uh, the explicit form. And in fact, uh, Justin and I and uh, so on had tried to, in some examples, at least try to work out explicitly what the form of. Thank you. Uh, many uh, years ago when we tried to compute these explicitly, but I think one can try to sidestep that as far as the uh, when trying to understand the uh, correspondence with the string theory. Yeah. Okay. <clears throat> so, um, so what I want to uh, uh, now, uh, just in the last uh, uh, remaining time, explain the geometrical picture of what is going on, because that's really what is most beautiful and uh, uh, connects with this uh, picture of uh, open closed string duality and uh, gluing up um, the Feynman diagrams. So, uh, so we, uh, so the way to understand this is that these treble differentials. 
what they are ultimately giving you, uh, 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 they uh, have uh, the um, uh, they uh, 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 lead to a foliation. Uh, of the mm, uh, Riemann surface into so-called horizontal trajectories, closed horizontal trajectories. So, I, I, so what are um, these? So, uh, in fact, the, uh, this notion of horizontal and vertical trajectories are defined for any. Uh, quadratic differential, they're a useful concept. Uh, if I consider a curve, uh, Z of T uh, on a Riemann surface, uh, such that if I evaluate uh, this so essentially I'm evaluating the quadratic differential on the mm, uh, on that curve. Uh, um, if this is positive, uh, I say that the curve is uh, and the z of t uh, is is a horizontal, and then. It's a horizontal trajectory. So, uh, uh, and uh, w what is the origin of this nomenclature? Uh, well, you, the simplest uh, uh, Riemann surface you can think of is the complex plane. Uh, and uh, you can consider the, the quadratic differential, uh, the simplest quadratic differential is just dz square. Uh, um, so, uh, uh, so if I just ask, what are the horizontal trajectories of this? Those are essentially these straight lines. These are just a, any any horizontal line is a horizontal trajectory because you can imagine if z is equal to t or a times t, where a is a real number and t goes from minus infinity to plus infinity, then that gives you um, and that gives you a uh, that satisfies this condition, and you get um, uh, uh, so any of these are horizontal trajectories. And in fact, um, it, it, you can define something like when it is less than zero everywhere on the curve, that implies z uh, of t is a vertical trajectory. Because once you have a horizontal trajectory, you can imagine in the vertical trajectories. Uh, uh, and uh, so, so here z is equal to a t, a belongs to real numbers, that's uh, uh, and minus infinity is less than t. This is uh, z horizontal of t, and z vertical of t you can imagine take to be some i times b t, where again b belongs to the real and Uh, so because of this i, you get uh, a negative sign. So that's what these lines are. These are i times bt. Uh, uh, so you, uh, so that's the notion of horizontal. Uh, that's where this terminology, horizontal and vertical uh, trajectories come from. But you can extend it to a general Riemann surface and ask about curves on which uh, this is true. And locally, you can always find curves. Uh, uh, but what is interesting and what mathematicians study is the global property of these curves. On the plane, I could draw it very easily. And locally in a region of the, locally a region of the, any Riemann surface looks like a plane. So locally, it would look uh, something like this, uh, except that special um, uh, zeros or poles. Um, uh, so, so locally, the Riemann surface has these horizontal and vertical trajectories. 
at every point, the question is globally what they look like. And this is where Strebel, uh, the Strebel differentials have this property that they give a foliation of the Riemann surface into these closed horizontal trajectories. Uh, so, um, so what I mean by that is that, uh, uh, so to, uh, to, uh, to understand that, I need to uh, draw a couple of more figures. Uh, so this, of course, I drew on the complex plane with uh, the simplest quadratic differential dz square. But uh, locally, that's true on any Riemann surface. As I said, you can always go to coordinates where it looks like dz square, except if you're near a pole or a zero. So near a, say, near a, a simple zero, uh, 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 you will have Uh, let's say without loss of generalities, supposing I'm just interested, it'll look like z dz squared, right? Uh, because phi has a simple zero. So when it looks like z dz squared, then the horizontal and vertical trajectories are actually more complicated. And you can, it's a fun exercise to just check what they look like. And you'll see that they look like this. So this is the z equals to zero. Uh, um, uh, so at, it's because of the z dz square, if you now try to look at the trajectories which are horizontal, you'll see that there's an e to the two pi i by three that will come in because uh, because there's, uh, this is like cubic in z. So uh, so you have a trajectory like this where where you have horizontal branches. Uh, which are like this, but away from z equal to zero, they will they'll be smooth uh, curves like this. And the, so these are the horizontal trajectories. And let me draw the vertical trajectories in another color. Uh, so the vertical trajectories will be actually will be ones emanating at uh, bisecting these angles, and then there will be others which are kind of perpendicular. So you have um, this other this uh, behavior, which is near a simple zero, and um, uh, and near a double pole, which is the other case that we have to uh, um, to think about for the Strebel differential. As I said, the phi s of z dz square that goes like some minus p square dz square by z square say so let's again we look at the origin so there near a double pole it uh, has uh, if we look at again look at the horizontal and vertical trajectories they're very easy to draw the horizontal trajectories are now concentric circles around this and uh, mm, vertical trajectories are uh, are radial lines which end at the pole. So just using this definition, it's very easy to uh, convince yourself. And this minus sign is crucial so that it, the horizontal trajectories are precisely the ones which uh, correspond to the concentric circles. So this is how the local behavior looks like um, uh, uh, for these uh, Strebel differentials. Um, and uh, what uh, globally that means what happens uh, uh, so the global behavior of the uh, Strebel differential, the horizontal and vertical uh, uh, trajectories. Uh, is uh, uh, is uh, uh, 
is as follows. You sort of have to put all these, these ingredients together. Uh, so what happens is that the Riemann surface uh, is divided into faces. Uh, which are formed by the so-called critical horizontal trajectories. So, uh, yeah. Uh, um, so the critical horizontal trajectories are uh, uh, things like this, which uh, which are not close. So the generic horizontal trajectories of a Strebel differential will be closed curves, but there'll be a few which, which will have like uh, vertices like this, uh, like the one near the uh, zero. And I'll just uh, uh, show a diagram in a moment. Uh, and so it will be divided into faces which are formed by these critical horizontal uh, trajectories. And each face contains a single, each face contains one, double pole. Uh, and um, uh, um, so, uh, so let me uh, uh, show this picture. It's a bit like this. Uh, so you should think of, so these, uh, these are the poles and the crosses are the zeros uh, and the thick black lines are the horizontal trajectories, the critical horizontal trajectories. So you see in the vicinity of a double pole, they're concentric circles, but of course they'll get distorted as you go further and further away. Uh, that was really in the vicinity when it's one over Z square, you'll get exactly concentric circles, but then they distort. Near the zeros again, you'll have the same structure, like I said, kind of three vertices. Uh, three edges meeting at the zero. Uh, and so it, so it divides up the Riemann surface into these uh, uh, regions, these faces. Uh, and, um, uh, and this is a case where I have, uh, there'll be also in this particular case, there'll be a pole at infinity as well. Uh, uh, and uh, these blue lines are uh, uh, some vertical trajectories. So that's sort of dual to, the original mm, horizontal trajectories. So what I want to uh, point out is that these horizontal trajectories form a graph, uh, um, which is a uh, mm, which it uh, which I will now just argue uh, is like the is essentially the dual graph to that skeleton graph that we had uh, earlier. Uh, and uh, this is, uh, so uh, this, uh, and the graph uh, formed by the critical horizontal trajectories. Uh, has, uh, each face, as I said, has a pole and there are n poles. So this is uh, um, and the number of uh, poles. And generically uh, it has trivalent vertices because uh, as I said, you have a simple zero generically uh, and uh, a simple zero, the critical trajectory uh, is like this, so it has a trivalent uh, vertex here. Uh, mm, uh, so, uh, mm, uh, and anything else can be thought of as a uh, sort of a uh, coagulation of uh, trivalent vertices. Um, so, uh, so for a graph uh, which has n uh, faces and generically trivalent vertices, you you have the relation that the number of edges is given by is related to the number of vertices as follows, because each vertex, there are three edges coming out of it, but uh, typically uh, each uh, uh, edge is double counted because it, each edge has two endpoints, uh, which uh, uh, um, so you're double counting each edge. So you have this relation. And if you put that into the relation that V tilde minus E tilde plus F tilde, 
is equal to two minus two G, the same sort of relation, but now for this other graph and this graph of the uh, Strebel differential, uh, what you have is that again, we get N minus B, uh, the number of faces is N and you substitute for, uh, once again, you substitute for uh, E in terms of uh, V. So you get N minus V tilde is two minus two G, which implies V tilde is equal to 4G plus 2N minus two. And so you would recognize that the roles of V and V tilde and F tilde are opposite to that of V and F that I had earlier. If you go and uh, opposite to uh, interchange. So uh, what was uh, there, we had N vertices and 4G plus 2N minus four, which should have been. Uh, and, uh, and E tilde is the same as before, it's 6G minus six plus two N, but now these are the dual edges. So, mm, so, uh, so you can identify this graph with the dual to the skeleton graph or the dual of this graph to the skeleton graph. And the lengths, uh, remember these LKMs, uh, we had for the E tilde, because each edge, each edge joins these uh, zeros, right? I mean, the zeros, is uh, each edge of this critical graph is between a zero and the Strebel lengths were defined as the contour integral along these edges. Oops, I made a mistake, I think I... Yeah. Uh, so, uh, and uh, the, uh, with, uh, and the lengths LKM correspond to the NIJs because there's a canonical identification between the edge and the dual edge. It's the one which is transversal. So, uh, so the data specifying the skeleton graph uh, of the Feynman diagrams uh, is identical to the data specifying the Strebel graph. Strebel graph and therefore the Strebel differential and therefore the point on the moduli space. Uh, so, so that's, uh, the this thing and so I, I since I'm out of time uh, I uh, I just wanted to say that uh, 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 the, the, you can make a canonical identification therefore between these two and this is a, a diagram as uh, uh, Pranavesh made it a very nice diagram which illustrates that so <laughs> have a four point function um, uh, and uh, various big contractions between them. That's what the first figure here is. So you have uh, four points, uh, Z1, Z2, Z3, and the Z4 at infinity. Uh, and you have different big sets of big contractions. So I clump, I can glue them first all together and form this sort of strips uh, or quadrilaterals as they would be conformally here. Uh, uh, so that's what uh, we are uh, gluing. Uh, and and that uh, 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 the skeleton graph that you get, uh, which is uh, this uh, this graph, uh, and the skeleton graph uh, is dual to the uh, the uh, the Strebel critical graph, which is given by this uh, uh, this thing. So all these uh, lines between the A's, which are like the poles. 
uh, which are like the zeros of the Strebel differential. So there's, um, uh, so you can very canonically uh, go from here to here to, and from here to the, the, uh, the Strebel surface. And uh, this is indeed, if you think of it in terms of the language of conformally in terms of the strips, this is exactly the sort of picture that I had uh, drawn over here. Uh, uh, because this is conformally equivalent to that. You should think of these poles as going off to infinity. So then you see each of these is really like one of these strips. This, this is going to infinity, this is going to minus infinity, this is conformal to a strip, and, I'm, and this is similarly, each of the different shaded regions corresponds conformally to a strip. Uh, and, uh, and I'm just gluing these strips together with some data which is corresponds to these treble lengths, which is specifying how the surface. So as I vary the lengths, I vary the Riemann surface, and that's the essence of the treble construction. Uh, and um, so, so this is the sort of uh, uh, bottom line of this uh, correspondence. Uh, so um, yeah, maybe I think I should. Uh, just stop here. Uh, and uh, so this is sort of, again, the broad brush picture. And as I said, this is uh, explicitly realized in the case of the symmetric product orbifold. Uh, I don't have time to explain it now, um, but uh, maybe uh, if anyone is interested, I can explain it after, after, the, after I talk about the ADS3 times S3 case, and so on. So next week I will talk about the specific, so this was sort of the general philosophy of how you can try to implement open closed string duality, both either by thinking of it from going from strings to fields or uh, today very more concretely in terms of going from uh, fields to strings. And we'll see in the next couple of lectures, uh, the concrete cases of ADS three times S three, uh, but more uh, broadly ADS five times S five. I mean, I'll focus more on the ADS five times S five, how this, um, uh, how you can actually try to um, um, uh, to sort of realize this picture uh, in in these specific examples. Okay, uh, so thanks. And uh, any questions or anything? Yeah. So uh, thank, thanks very much, Rajesh. Uh, so I, I had a question. So these uh, points A one, A two, uh, A three. Uh, so can you just remind uh, remind us uh, how yeah. you got them or what these are? Yeah. Uh, uh, okay. Uh, so uh, uh, so the uh, so in the treble. So they are not there in the uh, in the Yang Mills. You don't. I mean, they are implicitly there in some ways. Uh, but uh, what I so. Uh, the treble, they are the zeros of this treble construction. Uh, they are not independent. I can either specify the zis and the lengths, these treble lengths, in which case the ais are determined. Uh, uh, so, um, uh, so that's why we didn't have them directly in the uh, Yang Mills theory, because in the Yang Mills theory, we are specifying the locations, maybe are specifying the poles if you wish, where the operators are inserted and we are specifying these lengths, which are the number of big contractions or equivalently, those are the dual, uh, the treble lengths uh, of the dual graph. Uh, so, uh, but what I'm uh, saying here is that the way the, so given, so what you have in the gauge theory are strips of different lengths. And when you glue them together, the points where they glue together uh, the, uh, will correspond to these AIs. And those are fixed. Once I give you the strips, I don't have any freedom. If I give you the, uh, the bits of the strips, I don't have any freedom where they are. They become these AIs, which will turn out to be from the language of the treble differential, which in a sense constructs that closed Riemann surface, that gluing, they will be the zeros of that treble differential. Uh, <clears throat> So and these are sort of uh, 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 sort of sacred points because if if, if these were yeah, slightly yeah, uh, essentially uh, better, the, yeah. these points uh, that where they are can you know uh, this this point here uh, um, where the junction uh, I mean there's uh, it's uh, it's only in uh, in this it's a sewing prescription 
in which you you will have uh, i mean there's nothing uh, special about them in some intrinsic way uh, but in uh, this is if you wish a particular world sheet gauge uh, in which it's like in light cone string field theory or in uh, uh, witten's open string field theory is it's a special gauge in which the uh, uh, the strings are joined and and those correspond to these ai so that's why there is uh, ultimately nothing very special about them but uh, uh, but in this particular gauge, they turn out to be zeros of the uh, mm, uh, Strebel differential. And I should have said that, that the Strebel differential induces a very natural Strebel metric on the world sheet. Uh, and that uh, plays a role actually in some of the things uh, which I didn't uh, uh, mm, uh, mention, but uh, just uh, uh, there's a, mm, I mean, uh, corresponding to this, Strebel differential, you can just define a normal modulus of phi s of z. This defines a g z z bar d z z. And this Strebel metric has a very has many nice properties also. I mean, it's of course a conform, it's like a conformal factor, and where it vanishes are these AIs. Uh, so it's uh, so it's a particular world sheet gauge. Uh, so in this open closed string duality works most transparently in this world sheet gauge. And in in this discussion, uh, it didn't seem that uh, the, the the fact that you were talking about gauge theory or um, uh, I mean, what kind yeah. of gauge theory you're talking it, about that didn't play a critical role. It played a, a one very essential role, which is, uh, but uh, uh, it, the essential role it plays is in the fact that uh, you have this large end counting, which organizes uh, the diagrams into genus. So that's all you need. And the fact that these are operators are single trace operators. So, uh, uh, so the correlation functions can be given in terms of diagrams on Riemann surfaces. That's all you need. After there's nothing more than that. Uh, so in some ways it's good uh, because it's very basic information about the gauge invariant nature of the operators and the theory. Uh, but you don't, yeah, you don't really need too much more details uh, other than that. Uh, I mean, I should say that some things are like in the original Toft counting uh, for an SUN theory, you get orientable Riemann surfaces for an SON theory, you'll get non-orientable Riemann surfaces and so on. It's so it's only in those ways that information will come in. Uh, uh, so if you are working with a UN or SUN theory, you will get only orientable Riemann surfaces. But if you are working with SON or SPN uh, theories, then you will have uh, non-orientable ones as well. Uh, uh, so yeah, so it's essentially that Toft uh, idea. Any other questions? Uh, do you have the map between L, M, N, and, uh, and NIJs, or these L's and M's, the little L's and little M's? Yeah, uh, so uh, indeed, uh, so the, uh, so, uh, okay, there's a long history to that, but I will not uh, maybe uh, go into that. Let me just say, make one statement, which I know is true, uh, which is that, uh, in the case of the ADS three times S3 CFT, where we have explicitly worked this out uh, okay. for the correlators, uh, for large, uh, so that what we did was we were looking at the limit of very large correlators. And that's when things simplify in some ways. And uh, uh, large correlators mean correlators of operators with a large number of fields. Uh, so, so then the NIJs are very large. Uh, and uh, uh, so then these were equal. And then the claim is that uh, LKM is equal to NIJ. Uh, it's exactly a proportional to, if you wish. I mean, the proportional overall proportionality doesn't matter. Um, so basically, the L's are essentially proportional to N. And this was, in fact, the prescription that Razamath had made uh, in uh, quite a while ago in the context of ordinary Gaussian matrix models. Um, and uh, uh, 
I had had initially a somewhat more complicated prescription involving the Schwinger parameters of the field theory. Um, uh, and I think if you go away from large uh, operators, the dictionary is a little more complicated, but to first approximation, I would say that the L's are proportional to NIJs. They are essentially, you can take them to be equal to the NIJs. Uh, so that's when why I was uh, answering when uh, Aninda asked me, I was saying that uh, it, uh, it's just the width. Uh, the width of the strips is essentially these lengths. You see. And secondly, you said that uh, when you do go from these ribbon graphs to these triple uh, differential forms, you get the Riemann surface visualizations of this uh, uh, of the endpoint correlation functions. But uh, somehow you land up in some particular gauge on the Warchick theory. Right. Uh, uh, is there any way of visualizing where exactly the gauge is being fixed or how exactly it's, uh, this whole mechanism is fixing or, or projecting you onto some particular gauge? Yeah, no, that's a good question. Uh, uh, from the gauge theory point of view, uh, uh, I mean, from the gauge, uh, uh, yeah. Uh, so I, I think this is somewhat like a physical gauge in which you are, uh, um, in the, in the gauge theory, you just have these toft uh, graphs. They are essentially non-dynamical uh, um, uh, strips. And that's why uh, when you glue them together, all the dynamics is really in that gluing. And not, or if you wish, each of these are these bits. And the bits are like rigid rods. There's no and there's no dynamics in them. So it's some physical gauge in which somewhat like light cone gauge and so on, in which you've kind of removed all the unphysical degrees of freedom. And uh, so what the gauge theory gives you is a, a physical gauge in which the strings are. Uh, uh, so, um, so there is no, uh, at least in the weak, in this weak coupling limit, in this tensionless limit, the string is uh, is essentially a bunch of these rigid rods. So uh, the gauge theory automatically seems to be only seeing that uh, seeing that physical gauge. Uh, uh, in some ways, the uh, string theories a lot of the redundancy is absent when you go to the gauge uh, gauge theories. After all, you're really fixing to the basic physical degrees of freedom of the string theory. That's what the holography is also really capturing. Uh, um, yeah, so if I move from, yeah, sorry, sorry, carry on. Yeah, yeah, so that uh, that's basically the this thing that uh, gauge theory really knows about the, only the real gauge fixed degrees of freedom of the string theory. So you are saying that if I move, if I try to approach the gauge theory from the string theory side, what I would have done is first take the BRST cohomology and then uh, try to construct the gauge theory. But what you are doing is that you already are in a physical Hilbert space. And then uh, what you get on the string theory side is just uh, fixed gauge. I mean, there is no redundancies in the theory. Yeah. Uh, so this is what, uh, and now uh, next time when I talk from the other side, again, from the world sheet prescription, we'll be going to this physical gauge and we'll be, in fact, it becomes more like a topological string theory uh, because uh, once I, uh, so the proposal is that once you have the ghosts and everything cancel off the physical degrees of freedom, there's essentially some, only some generalized zero modes that are left. And those zero modes are essentially these degrees of freedom, uh, these bits, these, uh, just these uh, simple bits that are there. Uh, <clears throat> So uh, yeah, so uh, so you can uh, so the, uh, so from the string theory world sheet point of view, which I will present next time. Uh, on the world sheet, you can start with something where you can do the whole BRST analysis, uh, but you can see that there is a gauge fixed version in which uh, the only physical degrees of freedom are essentially these zero modes. I see. Okay, and uh, and. Uh... The final question that I have is, uh, so in the in your ADS3, S3, T4 story, we know that, uh, or you have shown that, uh, that the world sheet kind of uh, sticks to the boundary. Is yeah. there any way of seeing this thing, this behavior from uh, so far what you have talked about? Yeah, that's, uh, 
Yeah, I mean, directly from here, I, I don't have a very good uh, picture of that uh, from... So in a sense, what I was showing here was how the stringiness comes about, but I didn't, uh, at least in what I said over here, I didn't talk about the what the integrand on the modelized space is like. Right, right. Uh, I, I showed you that the sum goes over to an integral on the modelized space. So I was telling you how, uh, but uh, for the kind of question you're asking, I need to know what is the integrand? Is it supported only on uh, things near configurations near the boundary. And uh, in the case again of ADS three times S3 from the Lunin Mathur picture, uh, you, you, I mean, uh, yeah, you can see indications that uh, it is effectively kind of at the boundary, but, um, uh, but you, that requires additional input of what is the field theory integrand like. Uh, and so there might be some good way to see it in this picture, but for that I have to now look at the, not only the uh, uh, what each Feynman diagram is really like uh, and um, uh, argue that that corresponds to a world sheet which is effectively at the boundary. Uh, so what I was just uh, saying to Aninda earlier about uh, this treble metric, this uh, world sheet metric, um, uh, you can sort of see that this, uh, if you write down the number go to action with this world sheet metric, um, and then it, it, it has an interpretation in target space, which is uh, roughly like what I was, uh, that roughly the world sheet is uh, essentially at the boundary, but uh, you, you have to know that the integrand is, essentially like the number go to action of this metric. So yeah, so if you, um, and in the ADS3 case, you know, know this, um, and for the ADS5 case, we hope that something similar, we can say directly from the Feynman diagrams, the, uh, the propagators on the world sheet, uh, uh, propagators in the uh, CFT in the free young Mills theory. Uh, but um, yeah, uh, uh, but uh, that, that's, a further, that's more of a dynamical question, which I think uh, is interesting to understand. Okay. Okay. okay, thanks. Thanks for the wonderful talk again. Thanks. Uh, I think uh, we can give Rajesh a break because we we have to get together for another meeting. Very soon. Oh yeah, uh, <laughs> yeah. Okay, so we will reconvene on Tuesday, hopefully. Uh, we'll, yeah, we'll send out an announcement. Okay. Uh, all right. Okay. okay. Thanks. Bye.